Hi, Jean Schnupp here. Welcome to another of the Savvy Sightseer video vacation series. This time we're going to an American destination, New Orleans, Louisiana. This program came about as a special request from Long Island Reads, but it is a destination sure to capture the imagination of all virtual travelers. After all, many of us have already visited the vibrant city during Mardi Gras time as we watch wild partying on nightly news for the lead-in to Lent in the spring. My first visit to New Orleans left an indelible impression on me. Growing up near and often visiting Manhattan, the so-called city that never sleeps, you would think I wouldn't be impressed with another city that could hold that title. But I was. It has a very different vibe from the Big Apple, though. And while dining and bar hopping can go on late into the night, it's in more of a laid-back style. One of the city's nicknames, the Big Easy, does suit it well. I have yet to meet anyone who was disappointed when visiting the city, and I thank friends who shared for this program their own pictures and recollections of this intriguing town, also known as the Crescent City, for how it grew around a curve in the mighty Mississippi, or by its acronym, N-O-L-A, NOLA. We'll see many sides of the city with amazingly diverse districts, including the French Quarter, the Cities of the Dead, a grandiose plantation home, and Spanish moss-draped oaks. We'll investigate its roots in music, mysticism, and culinary arts. Founded in 1718 by French explorer Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville, the city has certainly retained a French influence. Taken over in the 1760s by Spain, it also reflects more than three decades of Spanish rule. It was acquired by the U.S. in the early 1800s. With a major international port on the Mississippi, New Orleans, or New Orleans, the locals, continues to be touched by various international cultures, such as African, Caribbean, Brazilian, Irish, German, and Italian, and is a fine example of a melting pot. So let's go now and visit what is considered to be the most international of cities in the U.S. A logical place to start exploring New Orleans is the world-famous French Quarter, about 100 blocks of distinctive history, culture, and architecture. The sector was laid out as a grid by French planners in 1721 and has had its share of devastating fires and floods, but has always been rebuilt and stands as a symbol of Louisiana's resilience. One of its most famous streets is Bourbon, named for a royal family in France and not the amber-colored alcohol. Although it is a stretch best known for raucous bar hopping and bead throwing partiers during Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras in New Orleans has been billed as the greatest free show on earth. Its roots in the city go back to its original founder, Jean Baptiste. When he and his brother Pierre landed near what was to become New Orleans, they held a small celebration and dubbed their landing spot Point de Mardi Gras, given it was on Fat Tuesday. That's the literal translation of Mardi Gras. This was the first Mardi Gras party ever held in North America, so it's no surprise it is here that the biggest annual event is held today. In their native France, Mardi Gras was a feasting day before the solemn period of fasting and abstinence leading up to Easter. A carnival was a typical French tradition, and over the decades, New Orleans party has grown to include grand balls, parades, floats, and even a carnival king, Rex. The word carnival comes from the Latin meaning without meat, and fish is the predominant entree during Lent. What sets this New Orleans tradition apart from Mardi Gras celebrations around the country is that there are no spectators. Parades typically have marchers passing by, onlookers and cheerers seating, seated in beach chairs along a main route. In New Orleans, though, everyone participates, dancing in the streets, singing along, and tossing and catching vividly colored strands of purple, green, and gold beads and trinkets. But the French Quarter, stretching from Bourbon Street to the river, has other personalities as well. And for starters, there's the iconic St. Louis Cathedral, a stately centerpiece in the old district. When laying out the grid design for the city, the French cartographer placed the religious center as the city's center. Named for King Louis IX of France, it is the oldest continuously operating site of a Roman Catholic cathedral in the United States. Louis was elevated to sainthood in 1297 in recognition of his work for the Crusades. He was the only French king to have been made a saint. 
Originally, the church was built in 1727, but later was rebuilt in the 1850s after a great fire had swept through the town. It is one of New Orleans' oldest and most recognizable landmarks. Its main bell, which survived the fire and still rings out the hours from above the church's clock, was constructed in France and installed in the original church as a celebration of the Battle of New Orleans, when Americans routed British armies during war, the War of 1812. It is inscribed in French, Brave people of Louisiana, this bell, whose name is Victory, was cast in memory of the glorious day of 8 January 1815. As well as the Battle of New Orleans, the cathedral has been associated with many of the city's historic events, with celebrations of Thanksgiving, for example, after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which was signed in a stately building next to the cathedral, and again to commemorate New Orleans' role in the Mexican-American War in the mid-1800s. St. Louis Cathedral has been visited by kings and emperors, princes and prime ministers, and most notably, Pope John Paul II in 1987. One of the must-do rules of sightseeing in NOLA is to just wander the quarter and streets like Royal, Charters, and Decatur. A description I've found that totally sums up the area is elegantly aged. There's lacy ironwork galleries overflowing with foliage, quaint and colorful facades, galleries and shops, shops and more shops that reflect all of the town's influences. French, Spanish, American, and Creole. Creole is a term that originally referred to descendants of French, Spanish, and Caribbean slaves and natives, but it now denotes pretty much any mixed racial person who came from another culture but adapted to New Orleans. Shopaholics and food lovers absolutely must wander over to St. Anne's Street in the heart of the quarter. Fans of NCIS New Orleans might recognize the area of St. Anne between Royal and Bourbon Streets as the fictional headquarters for the Naval Intelligence Agents. Wander farther down charters to, for some of the city's most famous eateries, like Muriel's, in a building whose roots stretch all the way back to the city's founding. It evolved from a lavish city mansion for plantation owners, to a spaghetti factory, and then to a restaurant, and along the way, picked up a resident unwilling to leave, a former owner who gambled his precious home in a card game in 1814 and lost. Although he committed suicide in the building, he is said to still mope around. Outdoor seating on the second floor balcony adds something special, a view of the city's two and a half acre historic park, Jackson Square, which is home to lots of outdoor vendors and an open air artist colony. Whether dining in or out, visitors can sample some of the city's most eclectic gastronomical treats around the square, like one of my favorites, beignets. Normally I do not go for deep fried foods, but I make an exception for these. Beignets were brought to the region by Acadians, those are French Canadians who settled in Louisiana in the mid 1700s. The ultimate to go food is the ubiquitous po' boy sandwich. It reportedly was developed in response to demand for a hearty but low priced meal for more than 1,000 streetcar workers who were walking the picket line in 1929. When strikers came to get a free sandwich from a local coffee stand, someone in the kitchen took their order by yelling, here comes another poor boy. Today's version is still very hearty and typically sandwiched between two pieces of French bread slathered with mayo or sauce is a pile of lettuce, tomato, and pickles laden with the meat or seafood of choice. As for the low price goal of the original, well, that may have gone by the wayside over time, and typically a po' boy today will run you about $10. Another dish with a backstory is Bananas Foster, a dessert named for Richard Foster, a local civic and business leader. In the early 1950s, his friend and owner of Brennan's Restaurant wanted to find a dish to promote the fruit that flowed into New Orleans port from Central and South America. His chef rose to the challenge and created a decadent concoction. Bananas sautéed in butter, sugar, and cinnamon, and then bathed in rum. Presentation is very important and a big part of the dish's popularity. If you have ever been on a cruise ship, you are sure to have seen a waiter dramatically set it on fire at the table side. The flame burns off the alcohol, leaving behind a smoky taste and a rum flavor, and it is then served over vanilla ice cream. June 24th is National Praline Day, 
a salute to the signature dish of New Orleans. Pralines are definitely not for anyone watching their calories. Scholars estimate that the vendors began to sell the French-based concoction, a blend of brown sugar, cream, and nuts, on the streets of New Orleans in the 1860s. Typically, pecans, which are plentiful in the area, are the base, but hazelnuts or almonds are also used. I put on a few pounds wandering stores in this town. Many shops had a plate of samples of pralines or another popular dessert, pecan pie. Other specialties you could sample in the old quarter are turtle soup, fried fritters, grits, and certainly classic seafood gumbo, teeming with shrimp, oysters, and red snapper and blue crab. Gumbo is a thick stew that draws on both French and West African roots of locals. Pretty much every family has their own recipe for the staple dish that could have chicken or sausage as its main ingredient instead of or along with seafood, and a wide variety of other ingredients, such as rice, celery, peppers, okra, and onions. Similar but decidedly different is jambalaya. This meal has represented New Orleans since the days when Spanish settlers predominated. They sought to recreate a popular dish from home, a rice dish commonly called paella. The Nola version typically tops a bed of flavorful rice with a combination of chicken, seafood, and sausage with peppers, onions, other vegetables, and spices. One seasoning sure to be in either of these dishes is Tabasco. Here, there's even a store on St. Anne Street that sells only items related to the red pepper sauce, which was first developed by Louisiana native Edmund McElhinney in 1868. His motivation was to give a little zest to the bland diet of Reconstruction South. He labeled his creation Tabasco, a word of Mexican Indian origin, which may mean place where the soil is humid. He patented his seasoning in 1870 and started shipping it around the country into Europe. The business is still family owned and operated on Avery Island, west of New Orleans. Edmund's great-grandson, Paul, branched out the family business and started the first Tabasco country store in 1987. At the shop, fans can find just about anything that the logo could be slapped on. If you happen to be visiting between January and Mardi Gras, a special treat is a king cake, a standard during the season that takes its name from the biblical story of the three kings who brought gifts to the baby Jesus. This coffee cake slash cinnamon roll is iced in the colors of Mardi Gras purple for justice, green for faith, and gold, symbolizing power. As if that's not enough, king cake is usually packed with fruit fillings and a thick cream cheese. Hidden inside is a little surprise, a plastic baby to continue the fun. The lucky one to find it, without cracking a tooth, then has to bring a king cake for the next party. To walk off some of those calories after munching your way around Jackson Square, a place to get away from the crowds and shops is a spot that's maybe not at the top of most vacationers to see list, but in New Orleans is another absolute must, to stop in at one of the Cities of the Dead, so named for their resemblance to urban centers. There are 45 or so grand cemeteries around town from which to choose. 31 of these are considered historic, and five are officially listed in the National Register of Historic Places. After learning early on that burying bodies six feet down below the water table was a bad idea, the city turned to above ground burials. Some of the mausoleums are truly works of art. A walk through a graveyard here is often a walk through history. But don't expect to come upon groups of people wallowing in deep despair. The opposite is more likely true. In addition to organized tour groups, you might find families having a picnic with a dearly departed one. The contention here is that cemeteries are for the living, not the dead. It's their connection to the past. Famed author William Faulkner perhaps phrased this concept best. The past isn't dead and buried. It's not even past. The future Nobel laureate wrote his first novel, Soldier's Pay, while living in Nola in 1925, and went on to pen such classics as The Sound and the Fury. At a cemetery, you may even get treated to a concert of sorts. When people die in New Orleans, according to the city's official tourism office, locals like to fill the streets with music, a celebration of the person's life as much as a mourning of his or her death. A typical jazz funeral begins with a brass band leading a funeral procession into the cemetery. 
Initially, they'll start with a slow dirge or an old ethnic spiritual song, and then build to a more celebratory beat, typically closing with a rousing when the saints go marching in, or a ragtime song like Didn't He Ramble. The idea is that when the deceased is laid to rest, or they cut the body loose, the mourners cut loose as well. Sidney Bechet, a renowned New Orleans jazzman, once said, music here is as much a part of death as it is of life. Passers-by are often swept up with the moment and even join in the celebration. Each cemetery has its own personality. Some are way more elaborate with elegant marble above ground chambers. Some have famous residents and a few infamous ones as well. Metairie Cemetery, chartered in 1872, is one of New Orleans' largest and most historic resting grounds. It started out as a racetrack, but was converted to a cemetery following the Civil War, and the oval shape of the track can still be made out around it. Among the graveyard's best-known residents are two notable restaurateurs, Al Copeland, founder of Popeyes, and Ruth Fertel of Ruth's Chris Steakhouse fame. Fertel, who passed in 2002, had paid an impressive half a million dollars in 1999 for this imposing mausoleum and then celebrated the purchase with a party at the site. Legendary trumpeteer Al Hurt is also a resident of this cemetery. Over at Providence Memorial Park, a few other notable musicians can be found. Mahalia Jackson, the gospel queen of New Orleans, was joined relatively recently in 2017 by rock and roll music pioneer Fats Domino. Perhaps Nola's most famous and visited, with typically more than 100,000 stopping by annually, is St. Louis Cemetery No. 1. Opened in 1789, it is the oldest one in the city and was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1975. Although overseen by Catholic cemeteries, people of various faiths are resting within the 600 crypts here. According to the organization, following the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution in the early 1800s, the demographics of New Orleans population shifted dramatically. Americans from the northern states flooded the city and brought Protestantism with them, and thousands of res refugees from Haiti arrived with a mixture of Catholic, Caribbean, and West African-based religious beliefs. The cemetery, they added, was enlarged to accommodate this influx. St. Louis No. 1 is listed as part of the African American Heritage Trail by the state of Louisiana due to the large number of historically and culturally significant African Americans interred within it. One unusual mausoleum here, currently empty, really stands out from the other more boxy graves. I guess its owner plans to stand out in the afterlife much as he has on the big screen. The nine foot tall stone pyramid belongs to actor Nicolas Cage. Inscribed in Latin, he makes the statement, everything from one. It is rumored he wants to be buried in this part of the graveyard because it is near the final resting place of Marie Laveau, and he was hoping that would bode well for him. By day, Marie, a local 19th century Creole, had been a hairdresser, but she was best known as the voodoo queen, parlayer of potions and charms. Her powers, which combined elements of Catholicism with French, Spanish, and West African spirits and religious concepts, reportedly included predicting the future, healing the sick, overseeing spiritual rights, and providing for the poor. Legend holds that she can still grant favors for the living, and that has led to hers being one of the most visited graves in the country. Unfortunately, it also led to havoc at the cemetery by those fulfilling the odd provision that believers mark three X's on her tomb in exchange for having a wish granted. To stop the vandalism, her tomb has been restored, and since 2015, the cemetery has been closed to tourists wandering in. And only those on a tour with a licensed guide can come by. Whether in a cemetery, bar, park, public square, you cannot escape the sounds of New Orleans. Though universally associated with jazz, the city is considered to be the birthplace of the genre, it's certainly not the only tune in town. From enslaved Africans to immigrants from Sicily, Ireland, Germany, Mexico, and Central America, a unique blend of musical styles has taken root here. Along with jazz, city airways are filled with Dixieland. That's considered a uniquely NOLA mashup, which draws on four major influences, including ragtime, blues, gospel, and military brass. There's also rap, swing, 
brass, blues, rock, pop, and something called Zydeco. Billed as a rollicking, bluesy cousin of Cajun music, Zydeco features more basic instruments, the accordion, fiddle, and washboard. The proverbial meeting melting pot of cultures has cooked up a feast of musical artistry. There's no shortage of stars who have called Nola home at one time or another that even non-music aficionados might recognize. There's Louis Armstrong, Mahalia Jackson, Harry Connick Jr., Jelly Roll Morton, Wynton Marsalis, the Neville Brothers, Jerry Lee Lewis, and way too many more to list. One place for sure to hear some great music, for free, is at the Musical Legends Park. It's a small spot tucked away off Bourbon Street, where musicians are invited every evening to play for outdoor audiences. Scattered around the space in the Café Beignet courtyard are life-size bronze statues of local musicians, commemorative displays, plaques, and artwork. Of course, there's any number of more formal ways to enjoy local music. Concerts, festivals, and museums have it all covered. For an entirely different musical experience, you could opt for opera. The city didn't just give birth to jazz, it was also the start of opera performances in America, with the first documented performance of the opera Sylvain in 1796. New Orleans quickly became known as the opera capital of North America. Works by European master composers such as Verdi, Rossini, and Bellini had their American premieres in town, often at the French Opera House, the center of social life from 1859 until 1919 when it was destroyed by fire. Mario Lanza, Luciana Pavarotti, and Beverly Sills have all graced the stages of New Orleans. And Placido Domingo was just 21 and a little known Spanish tenor when he first performed in the Crescent City. Today, the New Orleans Opera Association stages performances throughout town at such venues as Le, P Le Petit Theatre and the Mahalia Jackson Theatre. An essential part of NOLA is the National World War II Museum. Pay attention to that name. That's THE National Museum, here in New Orleans, and not where you might expect in Washington, D.C., though there's some very fine war memorials and museums there. It is the one here that Congress designated as the official World War II Museum of the United States. It is recognized by TripAdvisor as the number three museum in the United States, and it is ranked within the top 10 museums in the world. So how did New Orleans get so lucky to be the selected one for the honor to open it here in 2000? Dr. Stephen Ambrose, a best-selling historian whose works include D-Day, Citizen Soldiers, and Band of Brothers, was also General and President Dwight D. Eisenhower's biographer. Something Eisenhower said to him stuck, that it was a little-known businessman in Louisiana who played a key role in Allied success. Andrew Higgins was the man who won World War II for us, he recalls Eisenhower saying. If Higgins had not designed and built those crafts, we never could have landed over an open beach. In the 1920s, Higgins had developed the Eureka, a wooden boat with a very shallow draft that could easily come and go along the Louisiana Gulf Coast. The U.S. Coast Guard saw potential for the Eureka to be a landing vessel on European shores but it lacked an easy means for troops to disembark. Higgins amended his design, adding a ramp to the bow that allowed for about 36 soldiers to quickly get off the craft. These became known simply as Higgins boats, and they transported U.S. soldiers in every major amphibious assault of World War II. His success became New Orleans' success as well. 20,000 men and women worked to send out more than 20,000 boats for U.S. troops. Ambrose said he had made it his mission to recognize Higgins' con contributions to the war effort by establishing the War Museum in New Orleans. Five pavilions span the six-acre campus, offering an immense interactive experience. Actor Tom Hanks narrates Beyond All Boundaries, an introductory 4D documentary he produced, and there's an expansive collection of more than 250,000 artifacts and over 9,000 first-person oral histories that take visitors inside the story of the war, why it was fought, how it was won, and what it means for today. There's even a simulator experience of the final mission on the USS Tang submarine. Visitors start their journey at the museum by being issued a dog tag that is activates the story of a particular soldier at various stations, 
and then they board a 1940s Pullman-type sleeper car to experience for themselves the sights, sounds, and emotions of going off to war. They watch as landscapes from all corners of the nation roll by. Big band and other 1940s music plays. This unique approach is an important part of the museum experience. Organizers explain, during the war, America's trains were the primary means of moving servicemen and women across the country, taking them to basic training, advanced training, and finally, to deployment. Trains also carried them back for leave time. Between December 1941 and June 1945, American railroads provided 44 million rides to service men and women. Other iconic artifacts exhibited by the museum include Sherman and Stuart tanks, jeeps, and a restored C-47 aircraft that dropped paratroopers over the fields of Normandy and saw action in the Battle of the Bulge. You could consider walking the streets of Crescent City as a trip through a free open-air museum. The city has been referred to as architectural paradise. Most of the buildings predate World War II, with some going back to the 18th century, and these reflect the multicultural influences that took root over the decades. Buildings range from very small to grand, and architectural styles have some pretty unusual names, like Shotgun and Queen Anne. The Creole Cottage is the earliest remaining local housing type in the city of New Orleans. It was designed and built by the owners to fit their specific needs. The typical Creole cottage, heavily influenced by both French and Spanish construction methods, is one to one and a half stories tall, two rooms wide, and two rooms deep. Shotgun type houses in New Orleans date at least to the 1830s and is typically a long, narrow structure, one room wide and three to five rooms deep, with each room opening onto the next without a central hallway. It's a highly efficient and comparatively inexpensive design for the building very popular among the middle and working classes. It is probably the most prevalent historic building type in the city. One odd explanation for the name is you can open the front door and shoot a gun straight through the back door without hitting a single wall. I'm not sure about the reasoning behind that, but it is one justification for the moniker. A wider version is simply called a double shotgun. The bungalow style architecture in the upper right of this upper left of this screen features a roof dormer with multiple windows, eaves, and a deep front porch. It probably originated in India, Indonesia, or the South Pacific and was popular in the US in the early to mid 1900s. The basic bungalow is a one to one and a half story home, usually about as wide as it is deep. It's similar to another form in the lower right, known as the arts and crafts style a morph between West Coast and Prairie style U.S. homes with the English arts and crafts style. It was most popular in the 1920s and 30s. High style Queen Anne buildings frequently showcase wraparound porches, staggered floor plans, complex roof lines, bay windows, turrets or towers, and specialty shaped or stained glass windows. These came into vogue in New Orleans in the late 1870s and continued to be popular until the first decade of the 20th century. The Oak Alley Plantation, about 55 miles west of New Orleans, is one of Louisiana's most visited house museums and a great example of the Greek Revival style home, with 28 massive columns supporting a two-story gallery. The National Historic Landmark site, Landmark site is surrounded by nearly 30 acres and was completed in 1839 as a sugarcane plantation. Oak Alley is one of the most photographed residences in all of Louisiana, and one that travel experts from farmers claim is precisely what comes to mind when most people think plantation, a commanding white house, its porch lined with giant columns, approached by a magnificent quarter mile drive lined with stately oak trees. Hollywood evidently agrees. It's been seen in many movies and videos, including Beyonce's Deja Vu and B-Day, Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, which starred Betty Davis, the long hot summer TV movie with Don Johnson and Sybil Shepherd, the interview with a vampire, starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, and Primary Colors with John Travolta and Emma Thompson, among many other stars. There's even a 1984 episode of, a, of the soap Days of Our Lives that feature the house. Oaks are also the main point of the New Orleans City Park, 
where the world's largest stand of mature live oaks includes at least one that's more than 800 years old. These unique trees are known for their distinctive structure. Some of the oldest trees have limbs that are twice as long as the oak is tall. What I love most of all about this park is the distinctive Spanish moss draped gracefully along those limbs. Unlike some plants that attach themselves to trees, Spanish moss absorbs all its nutrients from the air and doesn't harm the tree that supports it. If you think the Spanish moss gives this grove an unearthly look, you may be right. Two legends tell different but similar stories about its development on these oaks. Both talk of undying love, but one says it involved a Native American couple. When the princess died, she was buried at the base of a live oak tree. The grieving brave hung her long black braids on the tree limb for, to mark her grave, so the legend says. And with time, the braids turned gray and the wind carried the strands from tree to tree. All the trees weep to this day, all the way to the gulf. In another story, it is a Spanish lover who was thwarted by his love's unjust father who had him strung up in a tree. Eventually, the man died, but his beard continued to grow. Legend says as the years went by, the beard only grew stronger and longer, covering trees far from the Indian Maiden's village. City Park is one of the oldest urban parks in the country. The 1,300-acre outdoor oasis, once Allard Plantation, has enchanted New Orleans since 1854, as depicted in this preserved postcard. Today, the park boat provides entertainment in a myriad of ways. There's an extensive 10-acre botanical garden and an open-air sculpture garden. It also offers a host of family-friendly activities like jogging, biking, hiking, pedal boating, uh, boating on the lake, an antique carousel, and turn-of-the-century amusement park. There's all types of sports fields and arenas. And it was at the City Park Stadium in 1964 that a little group called the Beatles once played. It was their only concert ever in the Crescent City. Although the wide variety of oaks are my favorite, they aren't the only trees in the park. There's also cypress, magnolia, pine, and sweet gum. Walking through them brings a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote to mind. The wonder is that we can see these trees and not wonder more. It's no surprise the park is a big draw for getting that just right wedding photo. Especially eye-catching places are the botanical gardens with a Greek-Roman colonnade and the pavilion of the two sisters, or the pop fountain, originally built in 1937 as a Depression Era Works Progress Administration project. It's not a mere water fountain, though, according to local folklore. In the 1970s, when the fountain had fallen into disrepair and the water was turned off, it became a gathering place for witches, led by Mary Oneida, who founded the first witch coven to be recognized by the state of Louisiana as a church. The so-called Witch Queen of New Orleans conducted many rituals at the site. The city has since reclaimed and restored the property, much to the delight of wedding planners and photographers. My choice for the prime backdrop for newlyweds in the park is the 1902 Langles Bridge. Standing on the bridge with that Spanish moss elegantly draping from the oaks and the perfect reflection in the water would certainly make any new couple feel this world is a perfect place for them. I hope you've enjoyed this trip to the Crescent City with me. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to that to say always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. If you have any questions about this program, email me or use the contact page on my website. Of course, I also invite you to visit my website to see any of the European destinations I've visited. When libraries are again offering in-person presentations, you can click my Programs tab to see where I'll be. And of course, visit your library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. And remember, as they say in the Big Easy, laissez les bons temps rouler, let the good times roll. <laughs>